Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. And uh, Congressman Mark Pocan on the line taking your calls. Jared in Downington, Pennsylvania. You're on with Congressman Pocan. Hello, Tom, and hello, uh, Congressman Pocan. I want to talk about it. will the Democrats, if they win back the House and Senate in 2018, will they push for articles of impeachment for Donald Trump? Because according to the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11 of the United States Constitution grants only Congress the power to declare war. We did not vote on any war. There has not been any vote. And if Trump takes us into war with Syria and North Korea and potentially Russia and Iran, um, I think he needs to be thrown out of office immediately and impeached. I'll... Um, I'll let you uh, answer that all fair. Thank you. Jim. Yeah, uh, you know, so Jared, by asking the question, you already put out one of the most important points, which is, you know, right now a lot of us are saying we have to keep every option on the table for a variety of reasons, not just that you know he has to come to Congress and he isn't, and and we've got some people debating whether or not uh, that's what it says, although clearly that's what you're supposed to do um, by law. But the question is, you know, from his business interests to Russian involvement in elections, a lot of e reasons that you could look at for potential impeachment. So we need to keep everything on the table we need to. The problem is you have to right now, you have to make the case strong enough that you get Congress to vote that way, and the Republicans are in charge of the House and the Senate. So your key comment was, if the Democrats win, could we do that? And I think, again, keeping every option on the table, in order to make this president follow the law, uh, impeachment is absolutely one of the options that we have to have available. And uh, while it's a heavier, harder lift with the Republicans in control, which is why we have to really make that case with dotted I's and cross T's, uh, we need to keep it available no matter what within 2018. And uh, certainly, if he starts getting us into wars, I think that uh, already 35, 36 supremacists percent support he has, while he may get an initial bump up, I think uh, people are, are not ready for this and uh, would be in a position that we could have huge electoral change in 18 and hopefully then uh, be able to hold him accountable, uh, hold him accountable if he keeps on this path. So uh, you make a very uh, strong point because as much as we uh, are looking at things that we think uh, fall in the category of impeachable, we have to be able to get them through Congress. You have to be able to pass that case. And right now that is very difficult. Bob in Oceanside, New York, you're on with Congressman Pocan. Yes, uh, Congressman Polkan, I wonder if anything has been done in your state in what I consider the very deceptive legal system in this country. And what I mean by that is people go into banks, they take out mortgages, they do all sorts of things with very fine print in the back of a document. Either it's too tough to read for the elderly or it's so uh, uh, ununderstandable that it's meant to trap people through deception. What is your feeling about that? Yeah, let me, I, I think I'm going to answer in a way that I can um, answer it a little broader, which is one of our concerns w when we created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, as it's often referred to. We did it for many of these reasons to make sure that consumers, whether it be through banks or, or mainly through financial institutions in general, uh, we've got something to, to make sure we're having an agency that's protecting consumers so that if someone tries to scam you, whether it be uh, someone intentionally scamming you or making it harder by, by doing some directives within internal processes, that there's some safeguard and someone watching out for you, having that referee in place. And that's something that we know the Republicans, as they're trying to dismantle Dodd-Frank law, one of the things that they want to dismantle is that Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and that's one of those important agencies that can protect you from deceptive practices. So I think the battle that we're going to have to do in Congress is that as they claim they're going to roll back these regulations, uh, which really are protections, uh, you always remember that whenever they say regulations, uh, you just repeat back the words protections, because that's what a regulation is. In this case, this agency protects consumers from the big banks and financial institutions, so they can't do what you're talking about, Bob. Wasn't there an effort to, uh, during the Clinton administration to, and in fact, I thought there was even legislation passed, maybe it was just an executive order, to, uh, to, to simplify contracts? Or am I, I'm mis the, maybe I'm misremembering. I, I don't know offhand, because I wasn't here during the Clinton administration. I don't remember offhand if there was, Tom. Yeah, but it, I, you know, I, I, I think his point of, you know, you, you, you're signing a mortgage document or an insurance document or whatever, and you may well be just, you know, signing away your 
Mm. Well, like binding arbitration, you know, committing to binding arbitration. We just have a minute until the break. I'm sorry. This is well, yeah, if you don't have a referee that's looking out for you, and that's what that agency does, especially when it comes to something like financial institutions, because let's face it, um, you know, so many people's lives, uh, you know, live and die by, by those regulations. And if someone's trying to do something that's going to take away the savings you may have had or uh, what you're paying for something with a, a you know, a, a rate that would make the mafia blush, uh, that's why you have an agency there to take care of that. And I think that's something that's definitely under attack in the next um, six months in this Congress and this administration. Right, right. Um, the the, the uh, I so I, I miss a, I, I got a time cue wrong here. I still have, we we still have one minute, but it's it's not enough to put a call around. I'm I'm sorry, um, but it, the the idea you know the Seventh Amendment guarantees the the right to trial by jury, and yet the Supreme Court has said that that can be eliminated if you sign a contract calling for binding arbitration, even if you don't know that you signed that in that contract. Yes. Is, is Do you expect Congress to ever do anything about that? I mean, the, the, you know, yeah. I, I think this is from memory. I could be wrong, but I thought Hank Johnson had a bill around that in Congress to uh, address that. But um, in this Congress, uh, if it's something that benefits the consumer, I doubt that we'll see anything moving just, you know, being very blunt. Because the Republicans control this Congress. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and they're just like, they're not, they're not in favor of the consumer. Amazing. Uh, unfortunately, the consumers aren't the people who fund their campaigns. Melody in Rochester, New York. You are on the air with Congressman Pocan. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for having me on. A first-time caller. Um, Thank you. So you had a, a guest on yesterday, Tom, uh, Timothy Snyder. And I so much enjoyed your conversation with him. And one of the things he talked about really struck me vis-a-vis -vis this um, – incident at United Airlines, and it is conformity, to watch out for conformity. And as I watched what happened on United Airlines, while I found it morally indefensible, I imagine it was legally allowed. So my question really to both of you, and even to myself, is um, what would you have done on that flight? And what do you think people could or should have done when that happened to that individual. Congressman? Melody, so I, I think, you know, this is a, a conversation point everyone's having. We watched that uh, video, uh, and I think everyone was uh, aghast at what United did. First of all, you know, I, I fly, unfortunately, all the time um, because that's uh, for my job. I had to get to Washington, D.C. from Wisconsin. And when there is an overbooked situation, generally you're not on the plane yet. So first of all, I mean, in order to put their four um, staff members on the plane and bump four people who bought tickets, you know, generally, you know, they'll offer uh, a price uh, and then they continue to offer until they find people, which is kind of following the free market, which they chose not to do. At $800, they quit offering, and then they said they're just going to randomly pull people off of the plane. So first of all, that, that was just odd that they were already on the plane as they decided to put these four people on. It's a, a bad practice by, I think, United. But second is, you know, if you think about it, if they would have gone to $1,200, they probably would have found for people to to get off the plane and use that as a future voucher. So for essentially, you know, for $1,600 or so, for four people at $400, they could have avoided all of this bad public relations. And in the end, they just were too cheap to do that. They decided that the profit they were going to keep, and they were just going to kick four people off who bought tickets and thought uh, that they were fully going to be able to, to do that flight. So I think this is part of going back to that problem we have with you know the antitrust law changes. When you have consolidation in industries, you're no longer responsive to consumers because there's only a few entities, and they all basically have the same policies, and in some cases, the same board of directors we're finding in some industries. So I think that's the place we can best address this. But, you know, I, I have said, uh, you know, when when uh, President Trump didn't allow some media into uh, one of his uh, briefings, that no media should have gone on. And I think if I would have been on that plane, I hope that I would have been someone who said, well, fine, let's get everyone off the plane, then let's none of us take this ticket, and let's figure out how to deal with United in a different way. We needed to take back our consumer rights. There you go. Rich in Greenwood, Indiana. You're on with Congressman Pocan. Hey, Tom, it's Rich. Uh, solidarity forever. You know, if we all know how to get up off that plane and, and walk, uh, <laughs> yep. that would have transformed it instantly. Brilliant, brilliant tactic. Um, I'm calling about uh, a, a point of international law 
that was able to be come to after the International Military Tribunal of the Nuremberg Court. Uh, Benjamin Ferenc, the uh, the 90-plus-year-old uh, attorney, was, was there as a young man. And I got to see this on PBS. It's called Dead Reckoning. I hope everybody can find that. Uh, it was War and Justice, Dead Reckoning. Uh, the reason I'm asking this question is we're, we're talking about this conflict between conflict between national sovereignty as a claim versus being able to charge a nation with genocide in the name of civilization. And I'm wondering if uh, Congressman Pocan could uh, help illuminate this idea that uh, we, we need to figure out how to point genocide as a condemnation against what is happening in Syria against those people. Yeah, Rich, I'll tell you, you know, I think there's a reason why we have the United Nations. And, you know, we could have done um, – I think that was the route you go. When this happened, it shouldn't have waited a week for Ivanka to see a photo she didn't like um, and then suddenly have the president, you know, take an action like he did without consulting Congress and, and, and doing everything that he did that now you can look back at and say, oh, my God, you know, it was – it was a failure what he did and unfortunately um the path was to get the world community uh to join together on this and we could have brought the, some of the partners that we needed to uh around this through diplomacy and this is an exact example of why you have to go to congress before you do something like this because we can have that debate and we're the most uh, we're closest to the people so it also happens to be the law <laughs> so um I, I would argue you know that's why we have the united nations and we need to make sure that we're um using dip diplomatic uh channels first and foremost and if he thinks that shooting 100 million dollars worth of missiles and allowing the next day planes are able to fly out of the same airfield is somehow a success uh, and that this is a repeatable uh, action for him in other areas, this is exactly why Congress has to be involved and why we need to have international diplomatic solutions. Cassandra in Middleton, Wisconsin, you're on the air with Congressman Pocan. Hi. Well, thanks for taking my call, and I am a first-time caller. Thank you. Yes, and um, I have a question for the congressman. I have lived in the state of Wisconsin for about 15 years, and I am a very consistent voter. And I, um, last March, last month was the first time I attended um, a Wisconsin, the Dane County Democratic Party um, meeting. And I have to say that I was a little disappointed um, with the Democratic Party or the Dane County Party, and I understand why we're having such a difficult time. When I walked through the door, there was not a welcoming committee, and there's all of these new people walking through the door because they're concerned about national and state politics. And so just looking at the problem from, you know, the county level, the county um, chairs, they have to do a much better job of organizing um, especially for new members, because um, the 2018 election, it is so important. And I do believe Governor Walker is beatable, number one, if we could field a good candidate, and number two is if we can get our people to the polls. So I will um, listen for your reaction. Yeah, hi, Cassandra. First of all, uh, Tom, Cassandra's a constituent. Middleton, Wisconsin is uh, just outside of Madison in my district, so uh, welcome. Uh, glad you're a first-time caller here, Cassandra. So, uh, you know, I, I just spoke to a group this morning, and every time I, I talk to people, I'm more convinced in Wisconsin we can defeat Scott Walker. Um, and Scott Walker has, you know, done so many national experiments to our state in the quest in order to r try to run for president and he has had no regard for Wisconsin and our, our long-standing policies of how we've done things, uh, including uh, how we've treated people in uh, organized labor. And he did the collective bargaining changes and went after prevailing wage and made us a right-to-work state and, and other things. Um, I, I, I do agree with you. He is beatable, and I think that we just have to think a little outside the box. There is a tremendous amount of energy right now across the country 
uh, with people who want to be more active. And I always tell people, you know, make sure you're reaching out to your elected officials. Make sure you're using your social media to amplify your voice so that your friends and people even outside of your area can do the same. And then work with those local groups to amplify your voice so that you can have even uh, more clout in doing things. And every organization is going to have to adapt. There's a lot of new people right now who are interested, and we have to give them projects and things to do to be that resistance that they really want to be. So I agree we need to crank up our welcoming of people for every organization. Tom Hartman. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. Ten seconds, Congressman. Yeah, I just I, I agree, Cassandra. More needs to be done, and I do think we've got some great opportunities in 2018 across the country. We'll be right back.